I'd like to welcome all of you. It is wonderful to see this turnout. My name is Sarah Duke, and I am the Curator of Popular and Applied Graphic Art in the Prints and Photographs Division of the Library of Congress. Today's program is sponsored by the Prints and Photographs Division, which has hosted the Swan Fellowship Program for over 25 years. It is my pleasure to introduce Zoe Copeman as speaker today. But before I do, permit me to say a few words about the Swan Fellowship Program. It is one of the few programs in the United States dedicated to funding graduate and postgraduate research in caricature and cartoon. There is no limitation regarding the place or time period covered. The Swan Board encourages research in a variety of academic disciplines, so long as the fellows focus on the art form. Swan Fellows must spend at least two weeks at the Library of Congress, consulting caricature and cartoon collections, and donate to the Library of Congress one copy of, publication, of any publication that arises from their research. The Swan Board, when offering fellowships, selectively awards, invites awardees to speak at the library and present their work in progress. We are very fortunate to have Zoe Copeman with us today. Ms. Copeman is a PhD candidate in art history and archaeology at the University of Maryland College Park. She earned her BA from the University of Maryland and her MA from the University College London. Her presentation today, Were They So Torturous, Reevaluating Modern Surgery's Underdog Story, is related to her forthcoming PhD dissertation, Cankerous Femme, The European Mastectomy and the Semiotics of Surgery in which she uses caricatures as well as oil paintings and medical texts to examine changes in public perception towards surgery in the 18th and 19th centuries. Zoe Copeman has been exploring caricature and cartoon not only in the prints and photographs division, but in the rare book and special collections division. It has been my pleasure to make collections available for her to research. Please welcome her today as she provides her insights into the images she has used. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was just a great introduction. And before I begin, I do also want to just thank the Swan Foundation for this opportunity to just get the dedicated time to look at these prints in person. It was just really eye-opening for me. And also, again, to Sarah for the amount of words that she pulled for me, despite being in a back brace. <laughs> and, and everyone at the PNP just been so lovely. Um, you in the research world are just the heroes. So before I actually get to the caricatures, there's a bit of backstory I actually have to address for this to kind of make sense, going back to the subject of my dissertation. So the subject of my talk today, representations of surgeons and their tools, comes out of, as Sarah previewed, my dissertation entitled Cankerous Femme, the European Mastectomy and the Semiotics of Surgery in which I investigate the visual language through which surgeons taught their trade from the 17th through the 19th century, a time period that really corresponds with the rise of academies specifically devoted to the practice of surgery. So here's just a little timeline of a few of those academies that you see here, notably Paris and London. And much of this history is told from the perspective of surgeons, and how their field transformed over the course of the 19th century into the medical discipline as we understand it today. This is the underdog story that I have referenced in the title for my talk. But in case you're not familiar with it, the standard narrative goes, surgeons, also known as barbers, were once placed in this hierarchy between physicians and apprentices. Apprentice trained apothecaries, rather. And surgeons with their own training, largely through apprenticeships, they were thought to lack the educations of physicians. You see, physicians, they had a university-trained education. And generally, physicians were the ones that you would go to to diagnose your disease and to get prescriptions. Surgeons were then brought in for procedures. That is to say, the physicians acted as the eyes and the brain, and the surgeons as their hands. 
And this relationship is shown in this woodcut I have on screen here, where a physician dictates as a barber anatomizes the corpse. And yes, barbers or barber surgeons were the ones cutting up criminal corpses after execution, often in displays not just for medical people, but for the public writ large. By the end of the 17th century, surgeons would try to divorce, the, divorce themselves from barbers by establishing their own separate field. And pretty successfully too, I might add, as today, when you go to the operating room, you don't expect to see a surgeon. Not, well, you don't expect to see a barber there, right? You expect to see a surgeon. But this separation was not so simple to achieve. In England, it was only granted in 1745. And this is a different timeline, as you can see, from the founding of separate surgical academies. But this is because the separation was less about formalizing education and more about limiting the practices of barbers. With these acts, barbers could no longer practice surgery legally. Naturally, however, these dates seem a bit cut and dry, and that's because they are. It's far easier to say that no barber in London ever practiced surgery again, but that would be a false statement. Much has been written on the reality of the 18th century medical market, where medical pluralism actually thrived. There were not only barber surgeons, but surgeon apothecaries, as well as surgeons who were a part of the Royal College of Physicians. And the hierarchy that I mentioned earlier of physician, surgeon, apothecary was not also reality in terms of practice nor in terms of public perception. The majority of the public had little regard for the physician that seemed to stick up their nose at them. So I'm showing you here a mid 18th century book written for parents actually informing them on how they could set up their children in a London trade for success. And this is one of the ways to show you how they disagreed with surgeons and how the physicians were not actually on the top of the tier. Because in Campbell's compendium here, he also reveals how the physician to enter the trade, he gives no advice. The only advice he gives is to be a gentleman. In Campbell's compendium, he also reveals to parents how much it would cost to enter and set up shop as a master in each trade. And here you can see that our three divisions of medicine have some of the least amount of data, which could be because it varied too much, Campbell lacked the data, or is already refer referred to with physicians, the requirements to enter and establish oneself was just as much determined on social standing as it was money. In terms of our underdog story, surgeons were indeed more of a mixed bag of backgrounds than physicians. But when it came to public opinion, surgeons were not seen as any lesser than their physician, apothecary, or as we will see, quack counterparts. The underdog story of surgeons being thought of by the public as lower than physicians has already been dismantled by such historians as Roy Porter and Arthur Lewis Wyman. Yet this narrative still pervades in popular media retellings, even more disconcertingly in actual surgical literature. It's here that the underdog story is reified to paint a picture of surgical heroism. And what interested me the most in that narrative was not the surgeon as hero, but the surgeon as once torturous, uneducated quack. And I came across this narrative time and again in surgical articles particularly devoted to the history of mastectomies and how trying an experience that was for patients until the widespread use of asepsis and anesthesia that would allow, as you see here, William Halstead to pioneer his radical mastectomy. This reveals why my dissertation uses the mastectomy as a case study, because it is a huge part of surgical literature, particularly in the 20th century. And it, part of that literature is this investment in this underdog narrative. To the extent that surgeons even became themselves anthropologists attempting to show how early modern surgical tools were also used for capital punishment by linking their surgical tools to martyrdoms. On this page are a number of articles that use representations of St. Agatha to make visible what women until anesthesia would have gone through when undergoing a mastectomy. And there's a lot to unpack there, which is why I have a whole dissertation on it. <laughs> 
from the fact that you have a saint standing in for patient subjectivity to, of course, the conflation of patients with criminals. But for the purpose of this talk, how surgeons and their tools are represented became a question of mine particularly since the tools that these 20th century surgeons highlight as representative of their torturous past were actually not used during medical mastectomies at all. My question, my question became, why such the emphasis then? And needless to say, I became a little bit obsessed. So this led me to then conduct a survey to determine not only how and when these tools would have been used, but how people actually thought of them during their respective time periods. Were they perceived as torturous by the individuals undergoing these surgeries? And the short answer is, as you could probably expect, it depended on the patient. What I also found was that the devices 20th century surgeons falsely attributed to the radical mastectomy were used instead in many different surgical operations during the 17th and 18th centuries for bone cutting, teeth, corns, and tumor removal, and even had affiliations with forceps later invented for obstetrics. Particularly because in Latin, forceps was a catch-all term for all these tools listed on the right in this table here, used as such in English and French in the 18th century. This is just to show you this mapping process that I did throughout all these different types of visual media, tracing how these tools were represented in all of them. More importantly, all these tools would have been used, I found, by a variety of other tradesmen of the time, like cloth makers, joiners, chemists, foolers, and farriers. And so you can see how this type of tool is actually associated with many different disciplines. And yet these trades, as seen earlier with Campbell's compendium, had different monetary requirements to enter them, and thus different social reputations attached. And in conducting this survey, I found that the forceps, particularly when paired with the surgeon, took on a symbolic nature beyond a tool of surgery, or even torture, but another aspect of surgery's underdog story, social mobility. And so for the remainder of this talk, I'm going to take us through types of satirical representations that utilize the surgeon and his tools as a symbolic device. These being either to critique the field writ large, critique individual practitioners, or my favorite, critique a political person or state not related to the surgical field at all, yet that casts various members as surgeons to reveal some truth about their barbarous nature. While we see these first two categories throughout the 18th century, this last grouping would only emerge near the end of the century, becoming a favored symbolic device of British caricaturists in the early 19th century. How and why these categories come about is the true subject of my talk today. So with that, we can finally begin with our caricature, critiquing the surgical field. In this print, fittingly titled The Battle of the Barbers and Surgeons, we see a frenzy of activity as these two professions duel it out. Even as 21st century viewers who might not be aware of the discrepancies between surgeons and barbers, we can readily distinguish the two through dress. So the surgeons you can see are wearing overcoats, their waistcoats, breeches, and tights, and of course their starched wigs. This is a very traditional, kind of even old fashioned dress for the period. Well, the barbers have much more updated dress with their shorter coats and, of course, their aprons. We also have distinctions made with the tools of their respective trades in their pockets. So the surgeons have their various saws, syringes, forceps, and, of course, their gold-headed canes, which was the mark of the licensed doctor at the time. And the barbers have combs, razors, scissors, and pans. But the more you look at the scene, the more those differences begin to dissolve. First and foremost, there is no difference between the barbarity of these figures. The central two are equally matched, while the flanking pairs show opposite outcomes. As this barber wails into this surgeon's face, the cane of another surgeon is about to break the nose of another barber. And the actual tools, the forceps and the pan, meant to represent each profession respectively, become useless symbols left to scatter the ground. And the wig being ripped apart by the dog 
could just as well represent the surgeon or the barber. As we see also, this one barber besides, beside the man about to whack him in the nose, he has a very similar dress. In fact, when we expand our view to the back of the brawl, there becomes really no difference in dress or attributes between these men and notably a woman in the back. And on the horizon through the window, a trope that is often used in art to show the true side of things, a barber's pole hangs with a pan from it. And that striped pole actually alludes to a bloody bandage, one that you would have after leaving a barber surgeon's shop after having your hair cut and your blood let. The pole is a reference to the once unification of these two fields that began in 1540 and lasted over two centuries. So we could just as much be looking at a scene from 1745 when the surgeons petitioned parliament to establish their own company and restrict the practices of, bar of barbers. Humorously actually referred to in this print by the central barber as he proclaims that he still lets blood for a penny while the surgeon charges a pound for the same procedure. And yet this is not 1745, but 1797, August 1797 to be precise. And another print from that month gives us a bit more clues to the situation at hand. In 1797, surgeons petitioned Parliament to have a separate Royal College of Surgeons, like the Royal College of Physicians. The surgeons, they no longer wanted to be a livery company. However, that bill that would have them have their own college was shot down in 1797 by the man also pictured in that print, who maintained that surgery was, quote, a mere trading company who should be compelled to use a galley pot and a red rag. Thurlow's speech was recounted in many journals and this whole kerfuffle widely portrayed in caricature as we see here in these two prints. And we already know that the surgeons would establish their college just a few years later. But during this period, the decades before it, there was confusion about where surgeons actually stood, not just with other medical practitioners, but in society writ large. A confusion that is also evident in these two prints. In terms of caricature, they have very similar styles, each using distortion to poke fun at the surgeon who seems to think himself above the barber. But I'll point out a discrepancy. Where the left image uses tools to associate the surgeon with barbarity, those tools are discreetly missing from their surgical peers on the right. Mary Dorothy George, in her assessment of this print on the right, says that these men represent the well-educated and dignified minority of surgeons, anxious for a college, whereas the majority during this period could have cared less. She says that most surgeons belonged to a class of small shopkeepers who were satisfied with their city company as it was allowing them to practice without the need for the type of medical education we have today. Now this sort of language associating well-educated with dignified, I find particularly interesting given that the left caricature shows these same characters slip back into a barbarous mode with ease. Nevertheless, I want to argue here that it is this very dichotomy between well-educated and less dignified which makes the surgical field and the surgeon a particularly potent symbolic device. As an individual that could be just as much a part of high society, writing bills and petitioning to parliament, and low society, brawling in the streets, the surgeon and the surgical field represented the malleability and uncertainty of the times, particularly when it came to social mobility. The overall confusion over proper roles in 18th century society is evident in the British cartoon prints collection here at the Library of Congress. On this screen alone, you see a mix of characters, from barbers, surgeons, and doctors, to dentists, undertakers, midwives, dissectors, and yes, grave robbers. The well-educated and elite alongside the ill-educated and impoverished. These are vastly different characters, and yet they are all united by a single tool, the forceps. But I'll argue alongside forceps, another characteristic defines all of them, the arrogance of thinking that they are above their true station. <laughs> 
We see this most prominently in this early example called the barber shop, an engraving from 1730, when barbers and surgeons were still one company, in which we see the master barber in the form of an ape holding a forceps up to a cat child to pluck the whiskers from his head while his apprentices bloodlet a cat woman in the back. And as if casting of these various persons in the guise of animals wasn't enough, the barber literally being an ape, the text accompanying the print makes clear its intention. A barber shop, a medley shoes, a monster's wigs, strong teeth and news. While one is shaved, another bleeds, a third the Grub Street Journal reads. The master full of wig and Tory talks politics and tells a story and swears he's not such a sot, but that he knows full well what's what. This caption entirely rewrites how we're supposed to read this print in that while it displays the barber surgeon as a quack, denoted by the various creatures hanging from the ceiling and esoteric language written on the wall, and certainly is unmasking the profession as uncouth because as I'm sure you also notice, the elephant man in the background is holding down the woman by groping her breast. What the print is really commenting on is social mobility. The reference to Whigs and Tories is of interest during this period in the 1730s, when what each of these parties stood for was constantly changing, particularly around what they thought of dynastic power and social order. But that doesn't really matter to the barber. All he wants to do is tell a story, revealing another important aspect of this particular time in the 18th century, that the barber surgeon shop was actually a place of political conversation. This was a place where the barber, he had subscriptions to journals where you can go and talk about the news while you waited for your appointment. Kind of like the magazines we have at our doctor um, appointments today. But this effectively turned the barber shop into a gathering place where people increasingly of different backgrounds could mingle, like the coffee shops of the 18th century. A similar satirizing of working class tradesmen overstepping their bounds is seen in this 1760s print, The Politicians, where we see various tradesmen who, while hawking their bills of trade, also lend out freely their political opinions. These two prints comment on something much larger than criticizing individual trades. They exhibit an increasing anxiety over the dissolution of clear hierarchies within society and not just from a class standpoint either. When surgeons began to encroach upon the practice of midwifery, which was not a recognized trade on its own, but an occupation that had been up until the 18th century traditionally held by women, countless satirical prints emerged making fun of the surgeon and his tools, condemning this damaging equipment. And the character that you see here is actually sold separately, but was the frontispiece for John Blunt's Man Midwifery Dissected, a work from the 1790s warning husbands of the treacherous and torturous animal that was the man midwife, while also teaching wives how to take back their practice. And just to be clear, the man midwife, or accoucheur in French, as you see on screen, was a surgeon. The debate of whether surgeons belonged in the birthing room was a long one that many feminist art historians have unraveled the nuances of already, including the specific role of the forceps as representative of the masculine world of scientific knowledge encroaching on the feminine sphere of domestic medicine. But I think it's also worth thinking of the forceps as it relates both visually and linguistically to the other tools of the barber surgeon who like his counterpart man midwife stood in two separate spheres of society. Moreover, to return to this slide with our accoucheur macaroni, the macaroni was a specific type of character that emerged in the 1770s as a figure that blurred class, gender, and nationality. As this other print here on the right shows, hiding behind all that hair and dress could really be anyone a country boy aping high society in the same vein as the barber surgeon pretending he could hold his own in the company of gentlemen. So rather than thinking about all these different modes of visualization as separate representations, we should be thinking of them together for what they were, 
a complex rhetorical system that capitalized on all these various associations. And when you do so, the surgeon and his tools emerge as a particularly potent reminder of the growing theories on liberty and freedom of this time, theories that would lead to such wars as the American and French revolutions. But before I get ahead of myself there, let's go to the second category I referenced, in which we find Prince not only criticizing the surgical field, but actually individual practitioners within it. So I've chosen to highlight critiquing the individual practitioner. This print of William Hunter. I think this really illuminates the reason why a surgeon and not say a butcher would become a costume for politicians to adorn in prints critiquing such revolutions. The caricature here alludes to Hunter's willful display of bodies to the public with his lectures and new museum. But this form of barbarity is not why I chose this print. The reason instead is how Hunter truly is the poster boy for how surgery could propel one from a middling sort to becoming the physician in extraordinary to the queen, a fellow of the Royal Society, and a professor at the Royal Academy of Arts, knocking elbows as much with the elite as he is here with the dead. And Hunter's path was similar to what Campbell describes as the ideal route to entering surgery in his trade compendium. You get a university degree, you study in Edinburgh, although notably Hunter went to Glasgow, and travel to learn the latest practices. Now, while that is ideal, far more normal was the other route I have on screen here, seven years of apprenticeship, which, as we also saw, had a threshold to entry with a minimum of 20 guineas. Less money, but still a lot to fork over at the time because that was about a year of a tradesman's income. During the 18th century, to legally be a surgeon in London, you had to go one of these two routes. This had to do with the, how the freemen of the city operated, where legally to practice, you had to become a part of the company. Yet, the barbers continued to bleed for a penny, and fullers, smiths, joiners, cloth makers, farriers, butchers, all kinds of other trades that used forceps, too performed minor surgeries particularly the drawing of teeth, as you see here. The reality is that many people conducted surgery with and without the consent of the company of surgeons. And important for our discussion is how much the media loved to poke fun at the company for this, for the encroaching of these other trades into their practices. As Ramberg shows in this print here, we have a palatial hospital that could be just as gruesome as any barbershop in the poor area of town, if not more so. And Hogarth's print here, The Company of Undertakers, it provides a fascinating view into public perception of the licensed versus unlicensed as it contrasts these surgeons based on the type versus the individual. The licensed surgeon types show no interest doing anything really but sniffing their own canes a common trope that you've probably already noticed in a couple other caricatures already. And in today's language, really think of it as a person who loves to smell their own farts, right? These gentlemen in their wigs stand huddled around as if jostling to be heard, confirmed by the text underneath, which tells us how every consultant has his own medical opinion. And to remind us of their social standing, you also notice that they are standing within a heraldic shield. Above that heraldic shield, however, stands three other figures, these being some of the most famous quacks or unlicensed medical practitioners of the 1730s when this print was made. We have here John Taylor, the oculist, denoted by his discreet physiognomy, the wink of his eye, and the eye on his staff. We have Sally Mapp in the center, born Sarah Wallen, also known as Crazy Sally, the bone setter shown with her club, and Joshua Ward, who again with his facial features, we can readily point out, but also by the mask that covers half of his face, which is a nod to the birthmark he had there. And as an aside for the rest of the presentation, I'm going to be referring to Taylor and Ward by their last names 
and Sally by her chosen first name because Map was the name of her husband that she only had for a year and who cheated her of all her money. So it just feels wrong to me to be calling her Map. But you might also notice there's no other portrait of Sally on the screen. As far as we know, no official one exists, and Hogarth's depiction of her is the one that follows her constantly, such as Cruikshank's print, nearly a century later, that emphasizes the jester's costume Hogarth forces upon her. And you might also notice, though, where these individuals stand. They are, of course, above the heraldic shield. And this is because these unlicensed practitioners were true celebrities of their day. Their practices were marked upon in the many newsprints that one might subscribe to and indeed read at a local barber shop. And many of these publications sided with these so-called quacks. Despite not being a part of the company of barber surgeons, these men and women had, so to speak, the run of the town. Sally often plied her trade of bone setting at the Grecian coffee house, which was a place where many of the Royal Society frequented, including Sir Hans Sloan, whose niece she actually treated. In fact, it is said that she operated there at his request. Taylor was known for his charismatic lectures across town, and Ward, after successfully curing the king, where all before him had failed, became the king's consultant, opened a hospital for the poor, and was by order of the king unable to be prosecuted by the College of, of Physicians for his practices, revealing another reason for his mask. The mask was a trope of the 18th century for the ability to exist in two worlds. It was often a feature of masquerades where an individual would wear opposite sides of their clothing, very similar to what we actually saw with the print of the man midwife. And going to masquerade with one side feminine, the other side masculine was by far the most popular choice. Ward's mask here indicates likewise the extent to which he traversed two planes, here of high and low society. Now at first glance, these three above look just as ridiculous as the men below them. Sally made out to be the most so in her literal jester's costume. Yet the print also requires us to have knowledge of how these three were actually received by the public during this time. A very popular verse in connection with Sally gives us a bit of a clue. And you, you can see the dairy down there. It's supposed to be saying to the tune of dairy down. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to save you all that awful sound of singing and just read it as a poem. You surgeons of London who puzzle your pates to ride in your coaches and purchase estates. Give over for shame for your pride has a fall and the doctors of Epson has outdone you all. What signifies learning or going to school when a woman can do without reason or rule? What puts you to non plus and baffles your art? For petticoat practice has now got the start. Hogarth's print then, fitting with his other satirical works, comments on the absurdity of the medical trade, where anyone can practice and make a name for themselves. And social status and gender have no true claim when men of the elite are no better than those from the country who wear petticoats, meaning women. What's important to understand is that during this time period, if you had the means, you could afford one of these men from the company of surgeons. But a lot of people actually couldn't. And so yes, you, play, you paid a blacksmith to pull your rod and tooth because they do it for a penny. And you'd pay a barber to bloodlet you because they would do it for a penny. Moreover, even if you had the means, as we saw Sloane's niece sought out Sally because Sally promised and delivered on what these educated men could not. And also remind King George II chose Ward and not these men. Certainly, we couldn't call London a free market, but medicine was something that the general public took upon themselves to understand in order to make decisions on who should be their practitioner. And license didn't really matter for them. Moreover, quackery wasn't someone who operated outside the bounds of proper medical education. It was rather outside the bounds of what was deemed appropriate by decorum. Another satirical print of these three, notably 
one of the few other depictions of Sally, where she sits actually in the background addressed by Taylor. This reveals what actually people were afraid of when it came to the unlicensed practitioner. The text to this print admonishes quackery as a whole by defining it as a person who lies about their background and relies on exotic names and fantasy to win over their clients rather than skill as it should be. Whereas Hogarth's work recognized Sally, Taylor, and Ward as individuals, what is most interesting about this other print is that though they are named, they have now become types associated with the worst aspects of surgery. And we know this because the figures of Taylor and the men on the left appear in an earlier print. While this figure represents the French surgeon Jean-Louis Petit in both prints, the figure that was John Taylor is now a certain Dr. Meager, a character that is supposed to stand in in this print, not for Taylor, but for a different doctor, Saint-André. This was the doctor who examined Mary Toft in that famous case, and he was the original one who vouched that she did, in fact, give birth to rabbits. If you're not aware of that story, you should definitely look it up after this talk. But for our discussion, this Dr. Meager is based on a real man that was neither Taylor nor Saint-André, but the French doctor, Misobin. Importantly, Misobin was trained and qualified to work in both France and Great Britain, and yet he too was lambasted as a quack, particularly because of his arrogance. His standing in for Taylor then is a nod to Taylor's own education. Far from being uneducated, as some literature on quackery would have us believe, Taylor's father was a surgeon, and he studied under possibly the most lauded surgeon of the 18th century, William Cheselden. The figure of Misobin applied to Taylor is to show us that education actually does not matter when it comes to quackery. The quack is simply one who advertises beyond their means, claiming to be able to do things that they really cannot. And as 18th century viewers, we are then not meant to read this print on the left as simply a retort against these specific individuals, but about these types of individuals. To be wary of any peddler who claims to have the secrets to health, rich or poor, educated or not. The figure of Jean-Louis Petit confirms this reading as Petit was one of the leading surgeons of France, appointing even the first director of the Royal Academy of Surgery there. But before then, he was also a member of the Royal Academy, and in 1726, the year of this print, when it was produced, was the time of his famous treatise on bones that it was translated into English, in which he addresses the problem of the quack bone setters who thought they could fix fractures without proper understanding of human anatomy. So his presence then is much more fitting in the 1736 print here to legitimize Ward with his address in hand, while ignoring the practicing bone setter in his midst, Crazy Sally. But with that, the reuse of Petit here, alongside all three of our quacks, as well as his servant, reveals a deep-seated anxiety beyond a quack overselling their abilities, which many practitioners did. And said this anxiety, as hinted at earlier, was the potential overstepping of bounds, not just of class and the education tied up with it, but identifiers that were increasingly being proposed as fixed throughout the 18th century, gender and race. Much has been written on the opportunities women would have had in the job market, particularly of the 17th century, when medical pluralism was even more the norm. Women often took over family businesses when their husbands died, were even married into trades for their skills, and daughters like sons could learn a trade from their parents. Sally learned bone setting from her father. Women whose fathers were surgeons sometimes followed in their father's footsteps, as well as becoming licensed surgeons in their own right. This was in the late 17th and early 18th centuries. Yet by the 1730s, when Sally was conducting minor surgery in the Grecian coffee house, rhetoric about women's place in those establishments were being questioned, and satirical prints of coffee houses show women more often than not as participants not in intellectual debate, but as servers of coffee and sex. While more scholarship unveils the history of women in medicine hidden behind these satires, 
much less addresses the history of the black medical practitioner at this time. Something that whether intended or not, the figure of Petit with his black servant brings to the fore. Now in our history, the black servant is often written off as another trope in portraiture or still lives, there to denote the wealth of a white sitter or patron, as you can see here with a painting that you can go see right down the road. And by no means am I implying that this trope of the black servant as a symbol of white privilege is not what is also happening here, because it is. But I was wondering why the association in particular with Petit. This is a scene that would have never happened in reality. But it did get me wondering, why then include this child here? A young man in the presence of a renowned surgeon would usually denote an apprentice. The case in the earlier print where the young son stands behind a miniature, as a miniature of his father denotes that he is being groomed for the trade. The black servant has no such marker of identification, and yet he stands in a similar position to Petit. It's here where a bit more history unfolds before us. In the 18th century, both Britain and France deemed slavery in their colonies imperative to the successes of their respective nations. And yet each had adages about freedom within the boundaries of their homelands that complicated things when enslavers decided to bring those they enslaved back to their English and French estates. The English had no clear law on slavery, and so many contradictory court cases ensued. The French, however, did have a law in effect by the time of these prints in the 1720s that stipulated enslavers could only bring their slaves back to France if they were to learn a trade. If they were brought under other pretenses, then these individuals could petition for their freedom. So to see a young black man joined to Petit recalls the many court cases that ensued in France and that would have been reported back to London in particular because Petit, not being an enslaver, would most likely only have a black servant if that servant were learning from him. It is also notable that in Petit's treatise on bones, he stresses the need for servants to help hold down patients, effectively comparing his servants to the itinerant bone setters of England, like Sally. The association between the black servant and Sally is linked then not only through their proximity on the page, but through the practice of bone setting itself in its official and unofficial capacities. This question of what type of individual was allowed to become an official tradesman was widely discussed and portrayed in the media in the 1720s and 30s in London, with concerns specifically to race. In 1731, a new proclamation was added to who could and who could not serve an apprenticeship in London, expressing that no Negroes or other blacks be at any time hereafter admitted into the freedom of the city. Freedom here referring to the official companies overseeing the trades of London. So like our company of surgeons. This proclamation followed a case in which a formerly enslaved black man had been brought to London in the 1710s to be baptized and apprenticed as a joiner. It was in 1731 that he had finished his apprenticeship and would have been accepted as a free man of the city to establish his own practice. However, there had been a question on whether or not this joiner, named Satya, even had the right. The alderman ultimately voted in his favor so that he could become a joiner in the city. But following the trial, they inserted this language to prevent any such case from happening again. At this point, you might be wondering what any of this has to do with forceps. Well, a joiner like Sadia and a bone setter like Sally would have all used forceps as part of their trade. And like the blacksmith, a joiner like Sadia could have offered other services like drawing teeth and setting bones to high and low society alike. I will also remind that the ability for so many people now able to seek out and choose their own medical practitioner, license or not, was due to insurgence of wealth into the city, wealth from the slave trade. In an age that was increasingly concerned with justifying slavery through false statements about the inferiority of people from Africa, the possibility of a medical caregiver being a black person must have engendered concern when already there was anxiety over what freedom actually meant 
for the privileged classes. Now, one might argue that there were so few black people in London in the 18th century that this black servant is once again simply a trope of exoticism rather than a symbol of the anxiety of an increasingly open market of medicine, especially when legally he would not have been able to apprentice and officially trade in the city. Well, as I've shown, one could get around these regulations quite easily. But more importantly, in the 18th century, just because actual black people were not numerous in Great Britain, does not mean their presence was not. Anyone who has walked around London has probably noted the amount of locations that begin with the word black. When distributing their handbills, doctors and other tradesmen played on this association by using small black figures to remind potential clients of where to find them. The reality was that the image of a black person was all around London's marketplace already. The fear now was that behind that handbill, one might actually encounter someone with that skin color to trade with. And to make this case, I'll also remind of Francis Barber, who is most known today as the servant of Samuel Johnson. But less recounted is the fact that once free, Barber worked for two years in the 1750s in one of the most successful apothecaries in London. Writing on how slavery was viewed in France during the 18th century, Sue Peabody, Peabody reveals why figures like Sally and Satya and even Barber would have caused such anxiety during an age obsessed with liberty. She says, quote, the problem of social hierarchies in a world where all people are to be considered free, i.e. not subject to others' domination, has yielded on the one hand a commitment to an ideology of absolute social equality and on the other, a system of justification for why some classes of individuals are entitled to more privileges than others. This is the ultimate reason why I believe by the end of the century, when taste for caricature in public prints emerges, that the barber surgeon becomes a powerful metaphor of modernity. Embodied in these prints as male and white, he is nevertheless also a brutal degenerate type wearing the dress of gentlemen while wielding the tools of a workman. He is a costume for politicians who are also elite and male and white to wear in order to reveal the moments when they too slip down the moral and social ladder into barbarity. Surgeons then were a unique representation of high and low social status in one, but also of the dangers of that social mobility in a free trade. If a country woman working in a coffee shop could heal more people than an academically trained company man. What could a formerly enslaved person do? Though my investigation began with a tool that I expected to be about surgery's rise from its torturous past, I found a wholly different narrative, one invested in its tools of torture, so as to define which individuals are entitled to more privileges than others. So I ask to conclude here, were they really so torturous after all? Thank you. Thank you.